My full name is Janie Iwamoto, and I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, February 7th, 1960. So tell me a little bit about your family. Uh, my family, my parents uh, grew up in Ogden. Their parents came from Japan. Uh, my uh, dad's father owned a Japanese restaurant in Japantown in Ogden. And um, his mother uh, lived in Ogden too. On my mom's side, her father helped start the Buddhist temple in Ogden and was very active in community. And her mother taught uh, English to the Japanese. Um, and uh, my father was in the World War II and in the Korean conflict. And um, he, along with other um, Nisei soldiers, received the Congressional Gold Medal a few years ago. And then they had the ceremony in DC and then in Salt Lake City. Um, he was in the military intelligence service um, and during the occupation in Japan. Um, and my father ended up, um, I had heard he wanted to be a dentist, but he actually um, had became, went into business and then he moved, they moved to Salt Lake after they got married. And then he ended up, at, I think, being deputy director of HUD and my mother did some accounting jobs and things but she um, did a lot to raise us. So what was your relationship with Japantown? You mentioned Japantown and Ogden. So was that some, was that, did you guys live there as well? Or, uh? No, I was born here, okay. Salt Lake City. And so then um, all I remember are stories of my, my it was a real Japantown with um, businesses and restaurants and pool yards, ha halls and all kinds of things and it was a place of community mm -hmm. and I heard nobody wanted that property back then but this was actually where the heart of the community was and a place of safety and community and so my father I had heard that he'd go down to Japantown with my mom and he would see a friends there and he would talk for hours you know they would just all mingle, be there and um, and I do remember as a young child going to um, Japanese movies and stuff, but Japantown was destroyed and everyone was dispersed, you know. The, um, I'm trying to remember the exact date, but anyway, the Japantown was destroyed and the community was basically destroyed then. Right. So there, there were some businesses that stayed, and uh, I mean, the only two vestiges really now are the Japanese Church of Christ and the Salt Lake Buddhist Temple. Right. Um, I think Pagoda survived for a while, it's no longer there, but they moved away and survived for a long period. And then there's a sage market that I heard is still there, mm -hmm. but everything else is pretty much gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So did, do you remember when it got demolished? You, how old were you during that time? I think it was in the 19, 1966 when it got demolished. Yeah, I was young. Yeah, so I was um, six years old. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay. You know, so. Um, so did you have a lot of connections with other children maybe that mm -hmm. were also from Japan? And what was that like for you as uh, having that identity? In Utah? Well, I'm a Japanese American. Right. So, um, but I, we ha I went to the, and I still go to the Japanese Church of Christ, and so I have a very strong identity because that was my church, and it was, um, you know, um, we went to church and activities. We still had festivals and things like that. So, I think my identity from my family is strong, um, and then I went after school. I went to law school in California. And that's where I probably learned more because I ended up my first year uh, working for the civil rights attorney, Del Minami. And in, during the summer, he had a law firm in Oakland. They're now in San Francisco. But he was the lead counsel for Fred Korematsu, the big civil rights case. He was actually incarcerated in Topaz. And so um, I worked with them, and they were a civil rights and 
other kind of law firms, immigration, different things. But in the evening is when I got to meet all these attorneys that were working pro bono to op reopen the Fred Korematsu case. He was, him and Min Yasui and Gordon Hirabashi, the three of them, they were convicted by the Supreme Court in the United States. And um, Fred, I met him and I got to know him and his wife, and she was Caucasian, and um, they were working to open their cases to try to get them, uh, their uh, convictions uh, overturned. And there was, so there, I got to meet all these amazing attorneys, you know, Peter Irons, who they did it through a writ of quorum nobis to do the case. And so then I ended up being in the courtroom when it was overturned in the district court with the Honorable Marilyn Patel. And, um, and so I think that's when I actually learned more about it, about that, than I did here because a lot of people, of course because of the discrimination, I, I see it, they didn't speak too much about it. And there's also this, um, from Japan, there's a phrase, gambate kudasai, and other things where you, it's, it's an, a, you know, it may be seen in our American culture, you know, we protest more and there's this American culture, but there's also this, what I was raised probably more is this, the quiet strength and you take, you, you know, it doesn't mean you just take it and lie still, but you, um, so, but then these three petitioners, like I met Fred Cormont, so if you met him, he's just a, that's where they say an extraordinary, he was an extraordinary individual, but he was very ordinary and that, you meet him as just a regular guy, but he didn't know that his, I'm an American citizen and why am I being treated like this? And so his was a test case and they, and it was overturned, you know, in district court. So that's kind of where I went to law school too and I learned more about legally things and then being exposed to that and kind of more activism in the Bay Area and then returning. And then when I returned, uh, during that time I was there, I was on a National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, the second year in existence, and we decided to have a meeting here, and I brought Fred Korematsu and Del Minami to come and speak for the very first Utah Minority Bar. Uh, so the Utah Minority Bar, Judge Uno and some others had helped start, so that for their first one we had them come. And so Fred came, and interestingly, we're. I wanted to work with some people in trying to honor Judge Uno for all that he's done with civil rights this year. And we brought back for the first lecture series and event, Del Minami, and I thought it was so strange that, because he could talk about the Muslim ban and how this is the same thing happening again. So, um, so anyway, I came back and uh, then I moved back and then um, I heard that the Salt Palace was going to expand. And the Salt Palace is a convention center um, for the county, and that was what ended up destroying Japantown. I think, as Judge Uno will say, they um, called on the Japanese community and wanted their support for development, which the community does support development, but had no idea Japantown was going to be destroyed. So they were told it was going to be over where the city and county building is now on 21st South and State Street, and that wasn't true. So anyway, we got involved at that point on uh, fighting the expansion because we didn't have a seat at the table and we didn't find out about it till the night before that Salt Lake City was go trying to partially close our, the street that first south. Um, and uh, during that time it was Mayor Rocky Anderson and he was very, uh, very supportive. Af and uh, they didn't close the street and from that point started this group that we started where Judge Uno's the chair or president, I'm the vice president, and we started this JCPC, Japanese Community Preservation Committee. And through that we were able to work on some of the height limitation, we put in a garden, not, it's to honor those who came before us, but it's more of a buffer because they were going to have ingress and egress right next to the Japanese Church of Christ, which we felt was very dangerous. So um, that's um, and then I went before the Salt Lake County Council and the Salt Lake City Council, and we got the street renamed to Japantown Street. 
and we're probably the only one in the nation to have a Japantown street named after it. And then we, um, they did some things to try to honor the community, like a gates and some um, different things. Um, but of course it just kept repeating history where we're kind of at the reactive stages all the time. So then came the convention hotel and we found, and that at that point I had run for office and became on the Salt Lake County Council. And um, we didn't know of this um, convention hotel. It's been talked about a lot, but we didn't know they were so long in the process. They were thinking of putting it on Block 67 as one of the uh, options. So we fought, kind of worked on that issue because just having a seat at the table and knowing what's going on, but that kind of fell through. And then they, as of recent, they said, we, no, we're not doing it on Block 67, it's away. And just understanding that the community is never against economic development, but it's just making sure that they talk to us before. So then at the end of my um, time on the county council, um, the, um, there was, I remember being at a funeral for Jerry Hirano, the minister at the Buddhist temple, his father died. Mm -hmm. And we came out and there were just these crates all over the place. It's from outdoor retailers, you know, and they just riddled the street. They fell and caused hazards and caused a lot of conflict on the street. So Mayor Karun and I worked on that with SMG, which they are the ones that hired to operate the convention center. And through that, then it's been a lot better because um, like other states, we found out they unload on schedule, they leave and they put it somewhere else. And so we worked on that together and that was, was, has been going along pretty good. But you know, each administration changes in the county and the city and the state and everything too. And so then uh, years ago, the Ritchie Group came and contacted our churches individually and they wanted us to sell our properties or give them a liquor license. And so we just had said no to that because we've been there. Our church last year celebrated the 100th year anniversary and the Buddhist temple before that. So then we found out now that later that they had this whole development and we kind of came in at the end again. And it's too bad because Salt Lake City uh, granted them the design to do it the way they did. But I didn't know how these legislations that we did as a state, how they impacted directly, you know, our uh, churches because they, the first was two years ago and I objected to it and I didn't really know, you know, it was like d two days or before the session ended and they changed the rule from 600 feet uh, with a variance so that meant you can't have alcohol within 600 feet unless you get a variance for schools, parks, and religious churches. So they changed that. They came in and talked to us uh, about 450 feet. And then by the time the last day or two, they said 300 feet with no variance. So what that did, and I think the LDS Church, and they were all in on this together to Try, I think the LDS Church told me they just, sometimes you could get a variance for 200 feet, so they just agreed on 300 feet with no variances, so that's it. Well, that impacted you know, the Japanese Church of Christ greatly and the Buddhist Temple because that uh, took away any bargaining power that they had to negotiate with a developer. It was a powerful tool taken away. So. Now they are gonna have a restaurant bar across the street and the problem, the big problem is we're the back end of that development and the garbage and trash recycling is gonna be right in front of the church. And that's to me the, and really in an urban design thing, I would think um, maybe it looks good as far as the area, but they've really killed both streets because the energy is gonna move into the block and second and third, you know, the two, um, Japantown Street and second south, the energy's going in, not out to the street. Yeah. So it's just in benefiting that, and then just to be the back end, you know. And so they'll have to have, they're trying to work with us now to say, oh, your festivals and this and this, and 
But you know, the worry is having all those residents living there and being able to. So then there was another legislation passed, which uh, last year, and I didn't even know about it, but it was in a kind of a deal made where $15 million would go to, it enabled transportation funds to be used on, I think it's something like areas of regional significance, but it's a private development apartment, you know. So they are gonna get $15 million up front. Uh, and I guess it's done, but to me, when a developer develops an area, they usually come in and they pay and then they get tax increment back. This way, they're getting 50 million, 15 million up front. They'll have to pay it back, but they get the money up front. And it's, so it's gonna be used for that apartment complex. So um, anyway, we've been working with them now and Salt Lake City has made some good efforts, you know, to, they did a mediation to try to work things through. Uh, and they put aside, I think, some money, 100,000 placemaking to think of things to help the street. Um, it still bothers me that it's the back end of a, you know, and, um, and then also if we want to, you know, it's partly, it's funding for us too, but, we would, the, um, if we ever developed that street ourselves, you know, and had some businesses that want to come in, because I don't know if you know the, the layout of the church, but I wanted to just show you that so you can kind of see. Um, so like, okay, so here's um, third and second west. And then this is Japantown Street. So the Buddhist temple's here, the Salt Lake Buddhist temple. And this, there's a Struvi building. That's the only piece that, Struvi. And then our church, JCC. And then the, um, the Buddhist temple also owns another building. And then there's two parking lots. And so um, this one is owned by the Japanese Church of Christ and Salt Lake Buddhist Temple. And then this would be, um, then there's this multi-ethnic center. Mm -hmm. And then there's, then there's this antique shop here. But this is the block and the Royal Woods, you know. So anyway, and then this is, um, Salt Palace and the garden was parking. The JCC had their, um, they had property here for their manse, which was mm -hmm. where the minister, w reverend would live and we, you know, did our newspapers there and stuff. But they, JCC also owned all this that they probably shouldn't have given up. Um, so, now the Ritchie Group is, um, so also what's interesting about the 300 foot rule is now they can have their bar restaurant here and I guess they measured it to the front door or whatever. But we, if we develop this and we can't even wave, the, wave it now, we could, nobody else can have a bar restaurant there. Mm, yeah. You know, so they've kind of isolated that market for right there. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so close. I know. Oh it is, it's sad. And so we have festivals too mm -hmm. on the street and all kinds of things and yeah. they have to, they, oh, so they made a, into their development a little roadway where they're gonna come and all the people that live here will come and park that way. So they're gonna have to come here. And then the trash and stuff is here, you okay. know. And so we have festivals on the street and this is usually where we have the stage and stuff. And um, I mean, we're for development, but it's just that we wished we had, you know, uh, and how it was developed, because being the back end, and now they're saying, uh, I mean, they, they got it approved, mm -hmm. but they also hired a lobbyist who is the lobbyist for this, <laughs> you know, to help them with legislation yeah. and everything that they needed, and that lobbyist is um, also with Salt Lake County and Salt Lake City, so. We're trying to make a new beginning and trying to work with them now and they're, um, 
Right. Uh, so, so they have said that they would repave these two parking lots and lower them because then if uh, we wanted to, we could be, have energy going into there blocking out, you know. But um, so they, would, they said they could build it in such a way to push it out. So that's kind of their offer. I, when I met with them with Judge, you know, we thought they were going to provide a little pathway in their, on, their, on their property, but they're saying on our property. So <laughs> it's, it's a little different. Um, and see, the thing is, too, they're going to have all this um, area where they're going to have an in street that they call their Regent Street. Mm -hmm and um, with all these shops and everything eventually. But we're saying from a planning aspect, if they had the garbage in that inside, like Regent Street has a lot of those, mm -hmm. it would only be a small portion of their whole thing, whereas this is like a big portion of the, you know. Right. So, so we offered that, but you know. It's already yeah. been approved by the city a while back, so. I think what makes a great city isn't just structures, it's people and their communities. And I think more and more important, Utah's changing, you know, and we have lots more minority groups and, you know, it's been kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to say, but, you know, of course it's the predominant church and LDS, but there's different nationalities. And I think the LDS church likes to welcome different cultures too but I just hope that we can know when we're making some developments that we realize that it's that you know it's not all about just density anymore it's just I think you see that like uh, people wanting that more is to have senses of communities and and so I, I hope that we can build on this and maybe it could be a great thing that we can mobilize people to maybe, um, there's not hardly any property left on this block. Like the Struvy is the only thing that's not owned. It's owned by um, Adam Wade or something with the car dealership. But their keys kind of long, their building, the parking is dependent on us because we own the parking. But it would be a nice to have a community center or something, you know, but it's, I mean, money, it's kind of about money and development, but I think they could see how, I was trying to talk to them about, we were trying to say, you should want this too, because our community and having these kind of, instead of killing the block, if we had something rich and vibrant here, it could help your community. It's a win-win situation. If you don't, if you don't kill the street, like these festivals and things bring culture, and um, it makes you, it makes a sense of community for everybody. And so, um, you know, I think we're seeing that with a lot of developments, like they had the Cottonwood Mall, where people don't want it just all, you know, one thing, and that we can have open space, gardens, communities where people can live and play and and work and everything. Yeah. What is the importance of telling and sharing one's story? Oh, that's so important in everything. Um, I was asked to speak on this exact thing in D.C. for um, two different groups. One was to the National, let's see, what's it called? Um, New American Leadership Project in New York. I, w I spoke at the White House for uh, a few years ago. And then for this uh, other group that does kind of more health policy. But the most important thing we talked about was telling your story, you know, and sharing your stories because, um, and it's been such an, a neat thing, like how many new people are even running for office and winning, you know, that they're all different stories and it's not the same. So I think it's so important I'm just trying to think this out because um, uh, even when I pass legislation or you tell your stories, you know, you, you have that story to bring to it, to bring it to life and to share different communities. And I think that's what we need because we, uh, 
I think that's how you pass good legislation too, you know, is to tell your stories and people's stories. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to say it, but you know. That, that, <laughs> I think that's, that's what brings a human connection. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, um, it becomes less, oh, me versus you, but us versus a problem, right. as human beings. Yeah, yeah so that. like, I don't know, I was just reading uh, that story in the Tribune yesterday with the Native American, the mm -hmm. school Redmond, mm -hmm. Redmond. It's so hard for people to understand how those words have been institutionalized and how much they hurt people, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, we, and that's why we have to really be open to hearing stories too, yeah. you know? But I think more and more people are sharing their stories about everything, but it's just exciting to me how many new Americans have come here too. And I remember speaking at this one, and I can't remember his position, but he was from India. And he said, we were at these executive offices, and he said every morning he looked at the White House and he just appreciated it, you know, every day. And they bring these different uh, stories and bring a different perspective, but he had his employees always appreciate the freedoms that we have. It's kind of hard now, man. But <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he, um, he inspired me so much, but I was so inspired by all these um, new Americans. Last year, I did an appropriation request to help with the naturalization process because um, people don't understand, like they were thinking, we don't want to legal, these are people here legally, but to get them to vote and to participate, and they help so much economically. And people don't realize that because all the different states that have done it, how economically it's helped there. Mm -hmm. So I think if people can understand, they have, they, a lot of people don't understand. And so anyway, that was, I really enjoyed working on that because it's to help more people get nationalized faster. They can be, um, you know, involved in their communities and they tend to be really active politically and economically and everything. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. That is absolutely so true. I, yeah. that's, I believe in telling stories. I mean, that's just, yes. like, I think it's so powerful. And um, I think that's really what, that's really the answer to a lot of things where if you just listen to somebody, yep. you know, it just changes your mm -hmm. perspective or at least opens up a different door. Yeah. There was this issue with the Odyssey Dance Theater. And I, I mean, I'm Japanese American, but, you know, they were talking about how the Nutcracker, how the, they were the Chinese dancers and how they were hopping and all that. And I, I didn't know that story where the reason they hop, they made, they're making, more making fun of it, I guess, or just that. But that's a very painful because they used to bind the women's feet and they couldn't walk. It was very painful what they did to them, you know, and a violation, you know, human rights violation. But that, you know, pe people didn't understand that that's, part of why that's so hurtful to, to just be doing those kind of things. But it's all about learning, yeah. you know? So once people learn, hopefully they're, you know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah.